Hi, welcome to Analytics for All. Uh, this is a whole website dedicated to uh, analytics, all things analytics, big data, predictive analytics, those types of things. Uh, today we're going to focus on support vector machines. A support vector machine is a machine learning classifier, meaning it tries to predict what group or classification an item belongs in. This, for anybody new to this, this is predictive analytics. We're making predictions. Uh, we're going to be using a binary classifier, so I want you to think of like true, false, yes, no type answers. That's what we're going to be doing. Is the lab test positive or negative? Should X student be admitted into the school? Uh, we're not going to go too deep in theory. We're going to just go more on how to actually use this system here. So we're going to do it in Python. But first things first, you're going to want to get your hands on the data set. I'm using a, a publicly available data set called the Pima Indians Diabetes Set, in which we look at some variables, uh, time to pregnancy, these types of things and determine whether or not the person has diabetes or not. One person does have diabetes, two or zero they do not. That's the basics of how it works. And to get this data set, uh, you simply can go to my website, which is analyticsforall.org. Go to the main page, you go down here, you look for machine learning, scroll down, get it all the bar over here. You're going to go to Python support vector machine, which is what this stuff class is. We're going to scroll down a little farther and we're going to look for the data set, which is right here, Pima Indians. Now, also, you can see in here, this it describes all the columns we have, which is number of times pregnant, the plasma glucose concentration in two hours, diastolic blood pressure, tricep skin fold thickness, two hour serum insulin, body mat. I'm not going to go, I don't even know what some of these are, so I'm not going to go into this. I'm not a medical doctor. I, my doctorate is in data science, so we'll stick to what I know. Okay, so once you've got it downloaded, you're going to go into Python. Now, for me, I'm using the Python distribution from Pan, from uh, Anaconda. And this is Spider, which is their IDE, their, their development tool, which I use uh, I recommend the, Pyth the Anaconda distribution simply because it comes with all, most of the tools you'll ever need to work with in data science. You can use any version you want. If you're a much more developed Python programmer, go ahead. But if you're new to this, uh, the Anaconda is not a good place. It's not a bad place to start. So let's start with what I'm doing up here. This right here are the libraries which I need in order to make this program work, which I'm doing. Uh, these are all come preloaded with Anaconda so you don't have to get them. So we're going to start the first one from sklearn, which is scikit-learn, which is a uh, machine learning data science library system for Python. We're going to import the train test split. I'll show what we're going to do with all these. Next, we're from SVM, from sklearn. We're going to import SVC. This will be the S support vector machine mo uh, model we're going to use in this example. From metrics, we're going to import confusion metrics. And from sklearn, we're going to import metrics and pandas as PD. Pandas is like a, it's a, it's a catch-all data manipulation, data uh, frame controller for Python. It's, I mean, if you work with data, you got to use Pandas, you get used to it. And last, I'm going to import OS. OS is, uh, it's a tool that lets you work with your OS, basically. You know, I'm working on a Windows machine, in case anybody wants to know, but it'll work with any one of them. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run this command here, this group of commands, and we'll look down here, and you'll see ignore the first part this is right here i just ran those they're in uh os i use just you know from this example just to kind of show you this is how you can go you can look and see what your current working directory is you run that and as you can see my current working directory whoops i just lost it is in down here os get you know, is my users and my name. So that's not where my file is. I know my files in my documents. So the next step is to download it to a daily data frame. My data frame is PD, read Excel, and then users, my name, documents, and the file. Obviously, yours is going to be different than mine because you're not on my computer. And then I'm going to upload it to the data frame. And then head is going to give me the first couple examples of the data so I can see, make sure I loaded the correct data. We'll run this and we'll take a look at that. And that's down here. So you can see it loaded the file. So now I have the first five rows 
from my Excel file, and it shows all the data is in there. I mean, I choose the head just to see the first five rows because I think it's like seven hundred something rows, seven sixty or something. It would over it blow out the screen; you wouldn't see anything else. Okay, so the next step I want to do is once we're classifying, you know, it's it's like any other form. It's like working with linear regressions and stuff. We have to have a label, so we need the class. So in our example, is the class. Now this class, as I showed earlier, is the one and zero. This tells you, are you diabetic or not? That's what we're looking for. So we want the class to go into a separate variable because that's the way these systems work. So we're going to pop it. So DF pop, what that does is you put the name of the column you want, and it'll remove it from the data frame and drop it. You can either just remove it, or in this case, I'm at giving it a variable. If I didn't use the variable, it would just blow. It would just you drop a data class totally. So I'm getting, putting in Y. So Y is now going to be the class then X will now be the remainder of the data frame. And if we want to look at this after we do it, we go here and we say, and as you can see, you've got the X head, which is the data frame with no class. And this is another example here, but I guess I didn't print. So here, let me just run just the Y head by itself so you can see. And, oops. and this will give you just the Y. So now you'll see that my Y is nothing more than the class variable. So, all right. So now we're set up. we got the data sitting in X and Y. So now we're ready to move on to the next step. And that is to do a train test split of our data. Why do we do this? Uh, we want to split the data up. We don't want to, if we ran all the data through the model and told it to predict the data we just looked at, well, it's going to overfit, meaning it already, it's seen all this data. It knows exactly what it is. So what we want to do is we want to feed a portion of the data through the model to build. And that'll train, create the model. And then we're going to take the remainder we held out and we're going to run it through the model and see how good the model is at predicting things. So, because now we have a testing set that we know the correct answers to, so we can run it through it get our predictions, and then compare it to what the correct answers would be. Uh, so this is why we split, so that we make sure that, the more, number one, we're not overfitting the model, hasn't already seen everything, and number two, so we can split it up. So we'll do the code for this. Now, you can name whatever you want. I just keep in mind, I have X's and Y's. So I create an X train, an X test, a Y train, a Y test, using the test train split command, which you see is from the SK model system. Put in your X. Put in your Y, test size, 0.33. So I'm saying that I want two-thirds of my data to go into train and one-third of my data to be held back as a test set. Okay? So the 700, you know, so you're looking at 20-something are going to be for my, you know, I'm at 200-something for my data set, my test set, and the rest will be in the uh, training set. Okay. So we can run that real fast. And nothing exciting. It just gives you right there. Okay. Uh, so now, here we are next. Now we're actually going to build our model. Okay. So I'm going to go with the model. And we're going to name it. This isn't, you don't have to do it this way. This is just a method I choose to always do. You know, make it it's a model, and it's going to be SVC. Okay. Inside this parameter, this parentheses here, there's parameters, tuning parameters you can make to adjust the model, all kinds of things. If you go to the SK Learn website, you can see all kinds of alternative parameters. I'm using the default, just you know, let's take a look at this easily. So we're going to name the model SVC, and then we're going to tell it to fit. Now, fit is the Python phrase or the SK Learn phrase saying to train the model. So in order to fit the model, we're going to feed it the X train and the Y train. So this is the two-thirds section we split off from the test train set. So we're going to go into here, and we go. Now, it ran relatively fast. If you get a big data set, like when I did for my dissertation, I did credit card fraud. Man, this took, it could take 10, 15 minutes to run the set. You get really big ones, you can be looking at overnight hours, even days. But this will run relatively fast, okay, because it's only 700-something, you know. So we built it. We're ready. Now we're going to go into predicting. So 
Again, now we use models. So this is why we named it BIM. We think we can just keep reusing it. So if we wanted to come back and change it to like an SVM linear or something like that, we could do it without having to change all the code. All right, so now we're going to predict. And we're going to predict against, we're predicting against the X test, which is the data set we, again, held off in the test train split. So this is the one third of the data set we got. And we're going to give it, tell it that I want all the predictions to be put into a variable now known as Y pred. This is Y predicted. Uh, I'm using, you're going to see a lot of people use the name. I didn't invent this naming because nomenclature, you'll find it in a lot of websites. This is kind of how most people do this. And it's, you know, you do it long enough that you just kind of becomes, you end up following others. So we're going to go ahead and run that and again there's nothing really to see because there it is if you wanted to see what y predicted looks like we can just do and go down here and type it in y pred dot head if i can type it'll work Oops. oh sorry that's actually a numpy thing so it wouldn't work but y pred there you see so it's a bunch of ones and zeros these are the predictions this is what it's saying that it's guessing that the first one on the list is is not diabetic the second one is diabetic so that's what you've got so as we're in next we're going to look and see well how well did we do well that's what this accuracy score is now the accuracy score this is a really simple measure what we're going to do is we're going to give it the y test and the y predictions and it's going to go through count how many were guessed correct how many match up and then it's going to divide it by the total number of it. So you get a, a score. It's, you, uh, it's basically a percentage. You know, you get the scores under one, but it's, you know, so just run it real fast. And this is a standard accuracy test. And what it comes out and tells you is, hey, you got 7.4 correct. So you got 74% correct guesses of the test set. In the real world, that's really not a bad thing to do. So, but well, how did we do? What was the actual performance? Let's take a look at that. And that's where next I'm going to come in. I'm going to use a confusion matrix. Now, confusion matrix is something a little different. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to run it. Then I'll kind of walk you through it. So confusion matrix is a method that gives us a lot more information because it gives us four total metrics to look at. Okay. So you get this little box here. And okay, 147, 19, 46. And you're like, oh, what does that even mean? Okay, that means nothing to me. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to bring you back to my website. And we're going to go back one, and we're going to scroll down to Confusion Matrix. Ah. Okay, so here's what the Confusion Matrix is telling us. Now, for, keep in mind, the minority class is always called positive. It's just a naming convention, and the majority class is called negative. So in every data set, so in this data set, the diabetics are the minority class. And so they're positive and the negatives are the non-diabetics, which you think like, oh, that's backward. You know, you would, it's, it's negative to have diabetes, not, but it's not, this is not a judgment call. This is simply a naming condition. So when you look at the box here, this is what you got to think about. So in the top box, that is the amount of negatives that were correctly predicted. So if we go back, and look at our example here, that would be this 147. So there was a hundred. 47 people that did not have a diabetes that were predicted that were correctly predicted. Okay, so let's go back and look at the others. Now we have false positive in the next one. We have false positive down here. So it was, it was guessed as positive, but it actually was not positive. So these are people that were predicted to have diabetes that did not have diabetes. And we can go down and look again at our example. And we will see that, oops, if I can get my example back up, we will look at it. And we'll see that 46 people were predicted to have diabetes that did not have diabetes. That uh, can be bad, you know. I mean, they'll have to come and do another test. It's not the end of the world, but, you know, you, you don't want too many false positives. Next one over in the corner is your false negatives because it was guessed to be negative, but it turned out to be positive. So these are people who have diabetes that we've told not, nah, that we predicted they do not. So 19. So 19 people with diabetes were predicted not to actually have it. And then finally, you have your positive positive, your true positives. And that's the people who have diabetes and were predicted correctly to have diabetes. And that would be 42. So that's where your accuracy, you know, if you want to get a closer look, your accuracy was, you know, 75, almost 75%, which is really, which is pretty good in a real world example. But 
So here's where your faults lie then. I mean, what what is important to you? Is it ba that bad that we picked that many falsely or that we misidentified? Those types of things you can go back later and tune and trace, which which I mentioned there's tuning tools within the SBC. Or you can try a different model to see if it performs better. But anyway, that's the model set. Uh, you can go back to my website. I have the whole thing written out, and we can look at some other. I have other uh, machine learning tools and information, Python, R, all kinds of stuff. Uh, thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you again.